Welcome back to Physics 142 Online. We're going to finish uh, this part of the course and the semester by talking about circuits involving resistors and inductors first, and then inductors and capacitors. So, RL circuits. When a current flows through an inductor and that current is changed suddenly, we've seen that the function of the inductor is to induce a back EMF that tries to maintain the original current flow. So how does the current in that kind of a circuit depend on time? So let's use a circuit that involves a battery or source of EMF, a resistor and an inductor all in series, and we're going to close the switch at a time t equals zero and ask ourselves, when the current begins to flow, how does that current depend on time? So the way to do this, of course, is to use Kirchhoff's voltage law. And when we go around this circuit clockwise, <coughs> we're going from lower to higher potential across the power supply, so that's epsilon, positive. Then we go across the resistor in the direction of current flow, which always goes down in potential, so there's a potential drop of IR. And then, when current is flowing through the inductor, and when it's increasing, when the current right after the switch is closed is increasing, then the inductor opposes that increase and generates a back current from its back EMF. That means if we assigned plus and minus sign to the inductor, the plus sign would be at the top, the minus sign would be at the bottom. So you'd go down across the inductor, down in potential, and we know that the uh, back EMF of an inductor is LDIDT. So minus LDIDT, that brings us back to the power supply and that should equal zero. So, how do you solve this for I? Well, you've got a term involving the current itself, but then you've got the derivative of the current with respect to time. So this is a differential equation, and one of the nice techniques for solving differential equations is to separate the variables. The current and time are the two variables in this equation, so we get all the current variables on one side and all the time variables on the other side, and the trick now is to integrate both sides of this equation. Whoops! to integrate both sides of this equation from t equals zero when we close the switch to some later time t. And that will give us an expression for how the current varies as a function of time. So setting up that integral, what we have here is just the, the two different sides of that previous equation, but with the integral set up. On the left hand side we're integrating with the variable of current, so we're integrating from current equals zero to some current i at a time t. On the right hand side we're integrating from time zero to a final time t. And notice I've put primes on the variables i and t. Uh, the right hand side of this equation is simple. The integral of dt prime from 0 to t is just t. So the right hand side gives us t over l. The left hand side gives us a natural log. And there's a minus 1 over r out there that multiplies the natural log term. We have to evaluate this between i equals 0 and i. So when we do that, we get the uh, log of epsilon minus IR, which is what you have for the upper limit, and then log of epsilon for the lower limit, and since those are subtracted, you can write this as the log of that quotient. And then I've combined steps here by multiplying both sides by negative R to get rid of the negative 1 over R. So, once you simplify, you get this expression. Now we want to solve for i, so we have to dig the i out from inside the natural log, so we exponentiate both sides, e to the power of both sides. The left-hand side is simple, the right-hand side becomes e to the, ooh, there's a typo there, that should be e to the minus rt over l, my fault. So the result, I think I have the sign correct in this next line. The result, once we take this equation up here and solve it for i, we've got to multiply both sides by epsilon and then do a little bit of algebra to solve for i. So we get i equals epsilon over r times 1 minus this exponential term. And the exponential term is e to the minus rt over l, where l, of course, is the self-inductance of the inductor. And what we do is look at that argument and realize, well, the argument has to be dimensionless. And there's a time variable on top, so it must be e to the minus t over something that has the dimensions of time. And so we define an inductive time constant, which is defined to be L over R, and we call it tau sub L, right? Because over here we had R over L, so if we divide the top and the bottom by R, we get a quantity in the denominator that's L over R. So that's the inductive time constant, and if you look carefully at this expression for the current as a function of time, at short times, e to the 0 is 1, so 1 minus 1 is 0. So when we close the switch, initially there's no current, but the current ramps up really quickly, but it reaches its final value, 
only as the time gets really large. So when t gets really large, this exponential term gets very close to zero, and the current then approaches the limiting value of epsilon over r, which is the dotted line. And it does so over a period of time that is uh, characterized by this inductive time constant. So the important point here is that with the inductor in the circuit, the current does not rise from zero to its final value instantaneously, but takes a certain gradual amount of time to do that. All right, so the inductor then opposes changes in the current flowing through the circuit, so these changes take longer than they would if there were no inductor. Now, uh, another thing that you can see an inductor might be useful for is if you have a current where there's initially no current flowing, the inductor can detect a changing magnetic flux, and that will induce a current in the inductor, right? So if you were uh, using an inductor to detect uh, electromagnetic waves, which have changing electric and magnetic fields, that inductor would be the basis for a circuit to detect radio waves. However, and as we'll see in just a minute, in practice a capacitor is used in series with an inductor in order that the circuit will only respond to certain very particular frequencies of electromagnetic radiation. And that leads us to our last topic, which is LC circuits. So if a charged capacitor, initially charged up, is wired in series with an inductor, and then we close the switch, charge begins to flow from the capacitor to the inductor. That means there's a changing current flowing through the inductor, which then produces a back EMF that tries to maintain the original current flow. So let's look at this kind of a circuit and try to calculate how the charge on the capacitor depends on time. Initially, there's a, a charge Q on the capacitor plates because we've charged it up, and then we're going to close the switch, and so the charge will flow off of the capacitor plates and begin to flow through the inductor. So let's see what Kirchhoff's voltage law tells us. This is easy because there's only two circuit elements. So if we again go clockwise around this circuit, Imagine that the polarity of the charge on the capacitor is indicated in the diagram, so we're going up in potential, and that would be Q over C from the definition of capacitance. The voltage across a capacitor is Q over C. Then, <coughs> if the current, when the switch is closed, if the current is increasing, the inductor again produces a back EMF, sending a current in the opposite direction, so it acts like a circuit element with a high potential end on top, low potential on the bottom. So then it becomes negative, LDIDT. So Q over C minus LDIDT brings us back to where we started, so that has to give us zero. Now there's an important point here. I is defined as the time rate of change of charge. But in this expression, with LDIDT, we're assuming that I is a positive quantity. However, because of this circuit starting with the capacitor charged up already, the current is actually minus the time rate of charge. Because if you think about the capacitor, as soon as the switch is closed, charge flows off of it. So the time rate of change of charge on the capacitor will be negative. So we have to put that minus sign in here in order that the current I has a positive quantity. Because whenever we write down I in Kirchhoff's voltage law, we always assume it's positive. So that means that this equation here becomes Q over C, and now we substitute in I equals negative dQ dt and take the derivative again, so we get, the two minus signs cancel, and we get L d squared Q dt squared. And again, you'll see this has the form of a differential equation because we've got Q in it, but then we've got a derivative of Q. By contrast to the RL circuit, here the derivative is a second derivative. So if we solve for that second derivative, we see d squared Q dt squared is minus Q over LC. All right, now, here is my question. Does this equation look familiar at all to you? Have you ever seen an equation like this where you've got some variable, in this case q, and the second derivative of that variable with respect to some variable, in this case it's time, is equal to a negative constant times the function itself? Hmm. Have you seen anything before like that, maybe even earlier in this course? And the answer, of course, is yes! For a mass spring system with a spring constant k and a mass m, when we applied Newton's second law and then uh, rearranged the equation, we found that the second derivative of position, of the position of the mass spring system with respect to time, was equal to minus the spring constant over mass times the displacement x.
And this has exactly the same form as the equation that we just found for charge. So it, the, char the equation for the LC circuit, the inductor capacitor circuit, was d squared q dt squared, and then it was minus 1 over LC times q. <coughs> so we'll see in a minute, we can use the solutions to the harmonic oscillator equation, the mass spring system, to give us very similar solutions for the LC circuit. You'll remember that when we actually did solve this equation, or at least we proved that this was true, we looked at the solutions and x as a function of time was equal to some amplitude, and we may have used a capital A for this, but we could also think of that as x maximum, times the cosine of a frequency omega t plus a phase angle phi, and that frequency was equal to, to the square root of k over m. So that constant out in front of the x, omega, was the square root of that constant, apart from the minus sign, of course. So, by analogy, this is a great way to solve differential equations. When we have a differential equation for charge, in this case, we look at it and we say, you know, we don't have to solve that all over again. We already solved an equation just like that, so we can use the solution that we obtained before and just replace the constants in order to get the solution of this equation. So we'll, we'll be able to solve for q of t instead of x of t, and we will have a q maximum, and then we will have a cosine of omega t plus phi, but omega won't be square root of k over m. Omega will be the square root of the term out in front of the q on the right-hand side. So if x is replaced with q and k over m is replaced with 1 over lc, here is our solution q of t is equal to some maximum charge, which of course is the original charge that was on the capacitor in the first place, times the cosine of omega t plus phi. But what's the omega? Omega has to do with the value of the self-inductance and the capacitance, right here. So these two equations are mathematically identical with just a change in symbols. But wait, what does this mean? What it means is, if there's no resistance in the circuit, which of course there's always some resistance because even copper wire has a little bit of resistance, but in the absence of any resistance, the capacitor and the inductor exchange charge, which means they're exchanging energy. Initially, all the energy is in the capacitor, stored in the presence of its electric field. Then, the charge flows off, and it goes all the way down to zero, but at that point, the energy now has been transferred into the inductor in the presence of its magnetic field. And then the charge flows back again. Because if you just look at this equation, this implies that Q, because of the cosine term, goes from maximum down to zero, back to maximum down to zero, over and over again, just like the cosine function does. So if there were no resistance, this process would go on forever. And the characteristic frequency omega is the rate of change, or sorry, the rate of exchange of that energy. How we measure this? Well, we would actually not try to measure charge, we would actually try to measure the voltage across the capacitor because it's easiest to do that with the kind of tools that we have available in a laboratory. So we take our solution for charge as a function of time, and then we remember that the voltage across the capacitor is Q over C, so we just write this equation down, plug it into the equation for the capacitor voltage. So we get Qm over C out in front of the cosine, and that simply is the maximum voltage. So initially, if all the charge is on the capacitor, its initial voltage will be maximum, then it will go down to zero, then it will go to a, a negative Vm, and then back to zero, and finally back to positive Vm. So the voltage will periodically change, but it will oscillate back and forth between a maximum and a minimum value. And, notably, <coughs> because the only two elements in this circuit were the capacitor and the inductor, their voltages, apart from a minus sign, always have to be the same. And that's just uh, one of the consequences of the loop rule. So, the question that we will try to address in class is, can we actually observe this kind of exchange of energy? I will see you in class.